Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And as you've probably noticed, over the last few months, we have been working on a giant Skyrim Mysteries iceberg on the channel. In a dramatic effort to document virtually every single unexplained Elder Scrolls phenomenon, and put them all in a neat little package. And while we're still not entirely done with that series, turns out it's gonna need another hour, I figured this week we'd take a bit of a break, and turn our gaze to a specific mystery that I think deserves far more attention than the passing mention it received. That being the curious case of the Ancient Sky Forge. Indeed, the Sky Forge, as it's aptly named, is a large blacksmith furnace located next to the Companions' Hall in Whiterun. According to legend, it is the greatest, hottest forge in all of Tamriel, and it has the ability to produce several unique forms of steel that can't be smithed anywhere else. As an emblem of its enigma, the forge is overlooked by a distinct and mysterious avian statue that no one in Whiterun knows anything about. However, while Bethesda clearly intended for this simmering smelter to be an object of limitless speculation, there are several clues and vague hints scattered across Skyrim and other Elder Scrolls games that, when assembled together, paint a fascinating history of this strange device. So, pull a chair up by the fire, pour out a glass of your finest Blackbriar Reserve, and relax as we begin our investigation into Skyrim's most mysterious metal manufactory. But first, quick word from today's video sponsor. Raid Shadow Legends has taken over and gaming will never be the same again. Raid is the first game to bring a true console-level experience to your phone. Like any self-respecting RPG, Raid has its own set of factions. My top three favorite ones include the Banner Lords, an army of noble humans inspired by medieval English and French knights. The Barbarians of Harkon are perhaps my second favorite, a legion of brutes who offer their services to the highest bidder. Finally, no RPG is complete without orcs. Lots of orcs who are taking names and, well, you know. And this month is huge for Raid. They just released a brand new faction, the Sylvan Watchers, with some amazing new champions. Forest Elves, Ents, Druids, Fays, they're all here and I can't wait to summon them all to play with. And if that's not enough, Raid's got a full lineup of events along with a new season of The Forge Pass, where you can get your hands on some of the most powerful gear the game has ever seen. Also, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Aina, 200k silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard. So you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Now we return to the story of the Forge. Indeed, the Skyforge's reputation precedes itself as characters all throughout the game mention the durability of its steel and legends of its blacksmith. Notably, Alvor of Riverwood, who offers the player a smithing tutorial after our escape from Helgen, will tell the Dragonborn to quote, remember him when we're crafting Skyforge steel after completing our training. You have talent. Keep working at your craft, and you'll be a fine smith one day. Why don't you keep that dagger and helmet? Maybe you'll remember me when you're making Skyforge steel, huh? Furthermore, within the city of Windhelm on the other side of the map, local blacksmith Owengol War Anvil commonly markets his goods as every bit as sharp as what you'll find in Whiterun. And when asked what he means, he explains that the city's Skyforge is world-renowned, that forges have their own personalities, and that the Skyforge's blacksmith, Jorlund Greymane, is lucky to work with such a device. Everyone says Jorlund Greymane is the best smith in Skyrim. I plan to change a few minds about that. Every bit as sharp as what you'll find in Whiterun. 
I respect Jorland, but he has the good fortune to work the Skyforge. Something about the fires. Their steel just holds tighter. If that makes any sense. You know what I mean. Forges have personalities, right? Evidently, the Skyforge is so well known for its unique properties that even the undead have remarks about it. Should the Dovahkin enter Whiterun alongside the ghost of Lucian Lachance, a follower we can acquire at the climax of the Dark Brotherhood storyline, he may say the following line of dialogue. Whiterun, home of the Skyforge. It is said a blade forged in its fires can cut through sinew as if it were parchment. Now, this isn't a Dark Brotherhood video, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about Lucian, but the fact that this ghost knows about the Skyforge is an especially big deal. As longtime fans will recall, Lucian Lachance was a character from the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, who lived 200 years prior to the events of Skyrim in Southern Cyrodiil. So if he, or his ghost, has knowledge about it, it's clearly quite well known. But perhaps the best authority on the Skyforge is its Forge Master, Jorlund Greymane, who has worked it all his life. According to Jorlund, the Greymane family has been operating the furnace for as long as anyone can remember, and it's bar none the greatest in Tamriel. Evidently, its embers just burn hotter and more consistently than what is supposed to be possible, and that enables it to produce higher quality metals. No one knows who built the thing, though. The Skyforge? Aye, my clanfathers have worked it since the first Grey Mains came to Whiterun. Skyforge steel is my art and honor. The companions need the best, so they come to me. Skyforge steel is all the companions will use, for good reason. At night, the eyes of the Forge's hawk statue glow an ominous yellow, alluding to a deeper magical connection. The most immediate impact of this place on gameplay is our ability to purchase exclusive Skyforge Steel gear from Jorlund at a slight markup. Skyforge Steel items are essentially just lighter and more powerful versions of normal steel equipment, and they are frequently used by characters across Whiterun, but very rare everywhere else. While this is all the base game really tells us about the Skyforge, it's big, it's famous, it's powerful, it's suspicious, you get the idea. An analysis of Skyrim's early history, and particularly the history of the Companions Guild, who, you'll note, just so happened to live right next to the Skyforge, provides some fascinating context. To explain, and for it all to make sense, we'll have to start at the beginning. The beginning of Nord settlement in Tamriel. You see, according to some, emphasis on some, we'll get back to that later, Nords are not actually native inhabitants of Skyrim or Tamriel in general. Instead, they hail from a now lost, mysterious continent, known as Atmora, located somewhere far across the Northern Seas. We know very little about Atmora. It allegedly sort of disappeared or became lost to modern society several thousand years ago, but it's described as a remarkably cold, icy, and hostile place, almost like in Antarctica or northern Scandinavia. Sometime more than 4,000 years ago, deep in the Morethic era, Nords supposedly began sailing down from their frostbitten homeland and establishing colonies on Tamriel's northern shores. At the time, Skyrim was dominated by a now extinct race of elves, aptly called Snow Elves, who had their own culture, cities, technologies, and society. They were a truly once great ancient civilization. 
At first, the early Nord settlers and elves got along well and lived in harmony. But their peaceful coexistence was not meant to be, and eventually, war broke out. Enter a man named Ysgrimor. Ysgrimor was supposedly the leader of one of the many Nord colonies in Skyrim, and shortly after hostilities broke out, his settlement was destroyed. This prompted him to flee back to Atmora and gather an army of 500 of the continent's greatest warriors. He and his newly assembled force then returned to Tamriel and opened up a can of whoop-ass on the elves. Ysgrimor and his 500 companions quickly won a series of decisive victories over their pointed-eared adversaries. And while details are rather sparse, it seems that within a few months, the entire Snow Elven military had been destroyed. And thus, the Nordic invaders were free to begin laying siege to the cities and resettling the land with their kin. And this is where we get our first written accounts of the Skyforge. Because after this moment, the 500 companions decided to split up into separate groups and each began conquering a different swath of Skyrim. One of these groups was the crew of a ship called the Jorvisker, and they sailed down the White River into the modern Valley of Whiterun, where they encountered this megalithic bird monument for the first time. And, well, I'll just read the account from Songs of the Return, which is basically a Nord Book of Genesis, if you will. Quote, Southwards they went, by beast and by foot. Elves they found, though none remained to tell what those battles entailed. The numbers of the Jovaskar never faltered, so shrewd were they in battle, with minds as sharp as their blades. Once as the sun beat from its high home, Yonder the tiny, the one who ran ahead, came over the hill to tell what was seen. Amidst a vast plain, his eyes had met a monument of a bird, whose eyes and beak were opened in flame. When his brothers and sisters crested the hill, they too saw its glory, but they were afraid, for no elven settlement could be seen to the horizon. This is not seemly, said Clue. Is not this wide land fit for harvest? Why have not the elves, vile to their coat, seen to exploit and tame it? They asked of their elven captives, for they had many, what they found unfit about these plains. Yet even the captives who still bore their tongues could say nothing of the valley. They looked with fear at the winged colossus, and from their babblings did the warriors of the Yovaskar learn that it was older than even the elves themselves. Of those who wrought it solid from its mother's stone, nothing could be said, but it was known to drive a magic almost as old as Nern itself. Some remnant of the gods' efforts to render a paradise in Mundus before the shattering of Lorcan. The first of many, this crew of the Yovaskar, heathens and ancestors to us all, feared no stories or gods. Indeed, if there was something the elves feared, they would have it for their own. Thus began the labors, once more, of Menro and Manwe, whose eager hands laid to the Atmoran wood which had borne them all across the sea. And what was their ship became their shelter, as this valley became their purview until the end of all their days. Thus began the building of the great city, circled by the running of the White River, as brought forth by these beloved of Ysgrimor. Yet but twenty-two of the glamorous five hundred companions. So, there you have it. When the first Nords arrived in the modern valley of Whiterun, they found that the Skyforge was already here. Not only that, but evidently the Snow Elves themselves were uncertain and afraid of the device. 
refusing to build anywhere near it, despite the valley being some of the most fertile land in Tamriel. The crew of the Yovaskar apparently thought this was funny, and just to spite their defeated foes, they overturned their ship right next to the Megalith and built their famous Mead Hall. Eventually, the area grew into the modern great city of Whiterun that we know it today. So, if the Nords didn't build it, and the Elves didn't build it, then who exactly did? Well, before we try to answer that question, I'd like to point out some things that we learn about the Skyforge during the events of the Companion's questline, as several crucial revelations are made throughout the narrative. Indeed, midway through the guild storyline, we learn that the Companions' leading members are all secretly werewolves, pledged to Hercene, Daedric god of man-beasts. Note, not all of the Companions are in on this, it's just the five highest-ranking warriors. They call themselves the Circle, and will invite the player to join them. Should we accept, and we have to in order to continue the story, they'll reveal a hidden chamber beneath the Skyforge, called the Underforge, with a shrine to Hercene, where an initiation ritual will be performed on the Dragonborn, and will gain the power to transform into a werewolf once a day. So, the Skyforge apparently has a secret compartment. What on earth is this place? None of our histories or any dialogue mention this secret cave beneath the Skyforge. Thankfully, shortly after the ceremony, we can ask Skewer, one of the members of the Circle, that exact question, to which he'll say the following. Here's all you need to know. Yorvaskur is the oldest building in Whiterun. The Skyforge was here long before it was. And the Underforge taps an ancient magic that is older than men or elves. We bring you here to make you stronger, New Blood. Now let's move. You still need to prove yourself, Welp. Mm hmm. Taps into an ancient magic older than men or elves. What? Funnily enough, the remainder of the Companion's questline largely revolves around undoing their curse with Hercene. Evidently, many members of the guild don't actually want to be werewolves, as their status forbids them from entering Sovngarde upon death. Instead, they're forced to spend the afterlife in Hercene's realm of oblivion. Here's the faction's leader, Codlack Whitemane's opinion on it. In any case, I have a task for you. Have you heard the story of how we came to be werewolves? The boy has a nugget of truth, but the reality is more complicated than that. It always is. The companions are nearly 5,000 years old. This matter of beast blood has only troubled us for a few hundred. One of my predecessors was a good but short-sighted man. He made a bargain with the Witches of Glen Moral Coven. If the Companions would hunt in the name of their Lord Hircin, we would be granted great power. They did not believe the change would be permanent. The Witches offered payment, like anyone else. But we had been deceived. The Witches didn't lie, of course, but it's more than our bodies. The disease, you see, affects not just our bodies, it seeps into the spirit. Upon death, werewolves are claimed by Hircine for his hunting grounds. For some, this is a paradise. They want nothing more than to chase prey with their master for eternity. And that is their choice. But I am still a true Nord, and I wish for Sovngarde as my spirit home. That's what I've spent my twilight years trying to find out. And now I've found the answer. The witch's magic ensnared us, and only their magic can release us. They won't give it willingly, but we can extract their foul powers by force. I want you to seek them out. Go to their coven in the wilderness. Strike them down as a true warrior of the wild. So, according to Codlack, the Companions have not always been werewolves, 
Their relationship with Hercene only began a few hundred years ago, suggesting that whatever magic the Skyforge is associated with isn't the Daedric Lords, at least not originally. Nonetheless, we eventually succeed in revoking the curse, and shortly thereafter, Kodlak will pass away. Interestingly enough, the final Companion's quest will see us attend his funeral, where the Harbinger's body is burned on a pyre atop of the Skyforge. Evidently, this is the tradition whenever a Companion's Harbinger passes. The Skyforge serves as their pyre. Immediately after the funeral procession ends, we can speak with Yorlund Greymane, and he'll say the following new lines of dialogue. You know, since Kodlak's funeral, the Skyforge feels more... awake. It's always been said that the souls of the heroes of old are what gives Skyforge steel its strength. But I think the Forge knows the greatness of Kodlak's soul. I can't really explain, but it feels like it's young. I'll wager it could now forge metal the likes of which hasn't been seen since eras long forgotten. I'm eager to try. Perhaps, because Kodlak was the first companion leader in centuries to have been freed from the curse, the Forge accepted him in a way that it hadn't for other recent leaders. And indeed, following this brief exchange, if we enter the Forge's smithing menu, we'll find that we can now craft unique Nord Hero gear. Nord Hero gear is basically just highly buffed ancient Nord equipment that weighs less and carries more damage slash protection than the normal stuff. Notably, the only way to acquire ancient Nord gear is to occasionally loot bits of it from fallen Draugr in tombs. It's generally not craftable, at least until we complete this quest and access the Skyforge. I should mention that the Nord hero items we can now craft are distinct from the Skyforge steel items we can purchase from Jorlund. Evidently, he remains the only blacksmith in the world capable of producing that. But even so, this moment has dramatic consequences on the game's lore, and raises several new questions. Could it be that all of the ancient Nord gear we find in ruins and at the hands of Draugr was originally created here, or used a similar type of soul magic? Is that why the secrets behind its design seem to have been lost to history? Also, if the Skyforge was here before the Nords and Elves, as all of our sources reiterate, why is its unique ability so associated with Nord culture? Well, I have a theory, but first, there's one more thing I'd like to show you. Just northwest of Whiterun, south of Valenrund, is a bandit-occupied ancient Nord fortress called Silent Moon's Camp. At face value, this place doesn't seem particularly noteworthy. It's just one of several minor ruins controlled by miscellaneous marauders. However, further inspection will reveal this site to be far more than meets the eye. Because at the top of the fortress, the Dovahkin will find another uniquely named forge, this one titled the Lunar Forge, and on a nearby crafting table lies a book called Notes on the Lunar Forge. It reads, quote, I've managed to get the forge itself up and running, but again, I find nothing special about its workings. These weapons were clearly forged here, Yet, the secret of their enchantment remains elusive. All I've been able to discern so far is some connection between the weapon's power and the appearance of the moons. The weapons themselves are crafted of what seems to be normal metal, but while the moons are high above, they gain an additional ability. It seems that once the sun has gone down, the lunar weapons take on a vampire-like power, transferring a small amount of health from the victim to the user. And indeed, all throughout Silent Moon's camp, the player can find various 
Lunar Enchanted Steel Gear, which offer considerable absorb health bonuses, though only at night when under the presence of a full moon. Notably, as the book alludes to, we can't actually craft any of these for ourselves at the forge. The author of the texts mentions being able to get it up and running, but being unable to figure out how to craft these weapons for himself, and we can't do it either. This all seems like the lead-up to some sort of quest where we resurrect and reawake the Lunar Forge, but there's none of that in the game. It just kind of all ends right here on a cliffhanger. A look in Skyrim's creation kit suggests that there may have at one point in time been plans by Bethesda for allowing the crafting of these items here, as well as potentially some additional content, but it's not exactly obvious. There's a couple of unused enchantments in the files that seem related to this, though it's hard to be sure. And even then, it's so little that if Bethesda did have bigger plans with the Lunar Forge, then they must have been abandoned very early on in the game's development. No matter, it's hard to believe that this device isn't in some way associated with the one in Whiterun. I mean, what a coincidence that would be, right? Some folks just decided to put a Lunar Forge a couple miles away from the Sky Forge? Come on! So, once again, we're left to ask, what's going on here? If these tools truly do predate both Man and Mur, who could have been behind them? Well, to get to the bottom of that question, let's revisit that excerpt from Songs of the Return that we read earlier where the Nords ask their elven captives about the Colossus's origin. The final paragraph reads, quote, From their babblings did the warriors of the Yovaskar learn that the Skyforge was older than even the elves themselves. Of those wrought it solid from its mother stone, nothing could be said, but it was known to drive a magic almost as old as the Nern itself. Some remnant of the gods' efforts to render a paradise in Mundus before the shattering of Lorcan. End quote. While to the untrained eye that may read as just a bunch of Elder Scrolls gibberish, these are actually very specific directions on where we should look to. You see, the gods' effort to render a paradise in Mundus before the shattering of Lorcan is, in my opinion, and evidently the YouTube user Bad Luck's opinion, who nailed this thing in a comment, a clear nod to an event known as the Elnefe Wars. The Elnefe were a collection of mysterious beings who blurred the lines between gods and mortals and inhabited Nern before it was even fully formed. Legend has it that they were once gods themselves, who decided or were tricked into, depending on who you ask, sacrifice much of their divinity in order to help form the world as we know it. Legend has it that the ancient Elnefe were divided into two groups, one being called the Old Elnefe, who allegedly arrived on the planet first, all together at the same time, and built a sort of advanced luxurious society for themselves, and the other group would become known as the Wandering Elnefe. And they arrived on Nern scattered, separately, at different times and places, largely left to face this new world without the comforts of the old Elnefe. Here's what the Anuad says on the matter. A large fragment of the Elnefe world landed on Nern relatively intact, and the Elnefe living there were the ancestors of the Myrrh. These Elnefe fortified their borders from the chaos outside, hid their pocket of calm, and attempted to live on as before. Other Elnefe arrived on Nern scattered amid the confused jumble of the shattered worlds, wandering and finding each other over the years. Eventually, the wandering Elnefe found the hidden land of the old Elnefe, and were amazed and joyful to find their kin living amid the splendor of ages past. The wandering Elnefe expected to be welcomed into the peaceful realm, 
but the old Elnefe looked on them as degenerates, fallen from their former glory. For whatever reason, war then broke out, and raged across the whole of Nern. The old Elnefe retained their ancient power and knowledge, but the wanderers were more numerous and toughened by their long struggle to survive. This war reshaped the face of Nern, sinking much of the land beneath new oceans and leaving the lands as we know them. Tamriel, Akavir, Atmora, and Yokuda. The old Elnefe realm, although ruined, became Tamriel. The remnants of the Wanderers were left divided on the other three continents. End quote. So, this great mythical conflict is essentially what shaped the world as we know it, and defined the divide between Man and Mur, who remain at odds with each other to this very day. But where does the Skyforge fit into it all? Well, during this mythical event, it's believed that Kine, Nord goddess of wind, sky, and storm, as well as her husband Shor, aka Lorcan, both fought alongside the ancestors of men. And the Skyforge has Kine written all over it. For one, her symbol is the Hawk. Which, well, yeah, the connection there is obvious. But the Whiterun Valley is also heavily associated with the wind as well, being described as perhaps the windiest place on Tamriel. So it makes sense that she and or her followers would maintain a special connection to this place. Furthermore, and this is the icing on the cake for me, in the Elder Scrolls Online, players who earn the Grand Master Crafter achievement will be rewarded with the blueprint to a Skyforge Steel Hammer, which is enchanted with Storm Magic, i.e. Kynes Magic. This hypothesis, if you will, would also explain why the Snow Elves feared the Skyforge so much as the Skyforge would have been used against their old Elnefe ancestors so many thousands of years ago. Okay, Nate, that all adds up and makes sense, but what about the Lunar Forge? What does this have to do with Kine and the Elnefe? Well, you see, dear viewer, during this war, Kine's husband Lorcan, or Shor, as he's known as to the Nords, also fought with the Realms of Men. Sometime during or towards the end of the struggle, Lorcan was captured by the gods of the old Elnefe, who, according to the book Lunar Lorcan, sundered Kine's husband, splitting him into two halves which they casted into the cosmos, becoming the two moons, Masser and Secunda. As the Skyforge is intertwined with the magic of Kine, the Lunar Forge seems to pay homage to her partner, and this is why both furnaces are located so close to each other. It's a representation of their cosmic union. My suspicion is that whatever content Bethesda cut from the Silent Moon's camp location would have shed more light on this. But alas, such are the woes of game development. Speaking of cut content, I originally planned for this video to only be 20 minutes long, but here we are at the 35 minute mark. So I think this is where we are going to finally wrap up. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. I know the story of Kine, Lorcan, the Elnefe, and all of that jazz can be very difficult to understand. And while I did my best to explain it for the purposes of this video, I think it would be worthwhile to do a full one hour deep dive on the subject sometime in the very near future, so expect that video coming out relatively soon. But anyway, I hope you all enjoyed. I think we really did get to the bottom of this mystery, like I think it's kind of hard to dispute this theory, but if you do have your own ideas, please share them in the comment section down below. I'd love to hear more perspectives on this thing. Again, thanks for stopping by, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.